Welcome everyone um, to A Plus Education Unplugged. Um, excited to have um, some remarkable old friends and guests join us today. And um, just a few things about education um, unmuted. Sorry, I think I may have said education unplugged. I meant to say education unmuted. Um, and um, um, these are meant to be um, relatively short conversations. We've got 30 minutes or so um, to touch on some um, interesting topics with really interesting people doing interesting things. They're not meant to be comprehensive. Um, nobody's allowed to share a PowerPoint or give a speech or give a lecture. So um, none of that from you today, Zach. And, um, and um, it's, it's meant to be, in, be fairly informal. We'll spend the first 20 minutes or so with me um, starting with a few questions. And then um, if we have time and if we have questions from the audience, we'll go to, um, we'll pick a question or two. Um, and um, so today um, is sort of, um, we've got two amazing folks um, that have both experiences in public policy and education and also um, have day jobs or night jobs in the food space and service industries. Um, and, um, and so let me um, just do a couple of quick intros. Um, folks can see more of their bios by just Googling um, Adrian Miller or Zach Neumeier. But um, let, let's, let's just start, um, why don't we start first with um, Adrian. Um, he's got a, a remarkable career and, and also has had some really interesting um, gigs over the year. Um, um, most recently, um, or recently, he's a James Beard award-winning um, author. He's a formal policy wonk. Um, he's a former um, a White House uh, leader, was in the Clinton White House, and also worked for Governor Ritter. So he's like, there aren't a lot of policy folks that are writing James Beard food books. In fact, I'm, I think Adrian is the only person I've ever heard of that's been able to make these transitions. And, um, and then we're joined by um, Zach Neumeier um, at his parents' house in um, Santa Rosa. Um, and uh, Zach also has a remarkable career in the hotel and um, service and restaurant industries. Um, uh, went to that famous hotel school at Cornell and he and a number of other folks um, found it Sage Hospitality and they run three of my favorite <laughs> Denver hotels, um, the Maven and um, the Crawford and the Oxford, and then they have a bunch of other hotels around the country and, and around the world. Um, so anyway, it's a pleasure for you guys to be here and it's a pleasure to have us have a conversation around food and education. So maybe if we could just start with, um, like, how are you guys doing relative to things starting to open up? We were just, we were just, chatting a little bit about that. And um, like, maybe we, maybe I'll start with you, Zach. Like, how's the restaurant? I mean, the, the hotel and restaurant business has been arguably the hardest hit during the pandemic. Um, and how is all of this as you're, you're still in business? And and we're still in business. Um, just, just to give a, which is, which is, a, it, it's been a hard year. It's been a really hard year. Um, uh, and just to give you the arc of it, so going into Jan February, the end of February, we had 6,500 employees across the country. By the beginning of April, we were down to 600. Um, so, um, and and while that's hard for us, it's particularly hard for our workforce. These are people who are really living on the edge. Many of them are, are you know, think of the average housekeeper who has two, is probably a sing, you know, most often a single mom, often with, you know, an immigrant, often with two jobs or from an immigrant community um, with really no safety net. And so the process has been really hard on 
on our workforce. We're back up to about 2,200 people. Mm -hmm. um, so the business has gone from closed to reopening. What's opening fastest are the restaurants. So people are dying to get out and not have an Instacart meal, um, not have a Grubhub meal uh, and be in a restaurant. So restaurants are coming back. Uh, they're going to be different, but um, I'd say our restaurants are, uh, when we're constrained at 50% occupancy, we're full. And so uh, the demand is sort of bursting at the seams and, and uh, we're, we're coming back um, and people are dying to eat out. Hotels will be slower and the resurgence of cities is going to be the hardest. Uh, the resurgence, you know, bringing uh, cities back because restaurants have been have been really decimated. Retail has been hit hard, and people aren't going to come back to offices the same way they did. Um, so I wrote down at the top of my notes here to keep the optimistic lens. So from here on out, I'm going to only give you the best case scenarios. But let's let's jump to Adrian or or yeah. So so Adrian, your day job is um, as the executive director of, of the Colorado Council of Churches, and um, and as I think you're the first non-pastor to run mm -hmm. um, that organization. And so how, and, and you're also, you know, about to come out with what will be a remarkable book on barbecue. So the, how are things, I mean, like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, similar to Zach um, and talking about restaurants and hotels, uh, churches have followed a similar arc and I was a little surprised because really, I just thought a couple months into the pandemic, I was going to hear a wave of churches closing, but they've been more resilient than I expected. And it's similar. There's a lot of people that have been desiring to, to fellowship and worship together. And so there's a lot of pent up demands. You know, there, um, a lot of churches have waiting lists now because they have to, you know, control how many people are, are in the sanctuary. So it's very similar um, arc uh, in that way. Uh, and then in the, on the food side, you know, my research has been hampered by my inability to go eat in restaurants, but I've been doing a lot of research, quote unquote, um, by supporting places through takeout and things. But, um, you know, for my forthcoming book, it actually did, the COVID pandemic did affect that because I, I had scheduled to do some California based research on barbecue and I had to cut that short because, the, you know, everything was kind of shut down. So, um, you know, managing and uh, I focus a lot on African American restaurants. So the thing that's going to be interesting to me is because of historical lack of access to capital, a lot of black run restaurants had a takeout model already. And so it'd be really interesting to see on the other side of the pandemic, how many have fared. The ones that I know of that have closed have really been the ones that had a, a significant sit down um, operation. So um, that's, that's just like a, you know, something to, that's going to be interesting to see after when, we, when it all shakes out. Yeah, um, we're gonna jump into the connection to education in a second, but first um, just wanna, you know, food and uh, food podcasts, TV shows, uh, you know, these things are becoming, have increasingly become popular over the years and cooking in general and going out to eat. Um, it's now, it used to be a luxury. Now it's a thing that everybody does on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, there are shows, I looked this up this morning, but the great British baking show, which I've watched a few times in this year had 13 billion minutes of watching. So like you can do the calculation, how many people are on the planet and how many minutes were watched on average of the great of the British baking show. So um, I, so lots of people care a lot about it, um, you know, and there have been some, um, you know, your book, a, your earlier writings, Adrian, are in history and cultural history of, of, of um, a cooking White House and all this other stuff. And then, you know, one of my favorite documentaries is the Jonathan Gold documentary from a few years ago, City of Gold, which was sort of a document documentary around his writing around food and sort of and writing around um, sort of lower end ethnic restaurants and taking writing out of the sort of super high end food critique writing, but also was um, super interesting in terms of a cultural history of Los Angeles um, and the relationship to its food and its immigrants and culture and LA. And I and so I guess, like, 
how should how should we like think about all of this emergence of and the importance obviously of food we need it to survive and we experience it kind of every few hours at least some of us I, how should this connect to education well and does yeah well i think so because personally um you know, I, I just think it's a fascinating time, um, especially with all that's going on with food and just kind of the, the discussions that's going on. And so, you know, in education, we're talking about, well, how, and, and this is something that for, former First Lady Michelle Obama was really interested in, right, is how do we get healthy eating, get our kids, uh, you know, connected to their food again. Um, and so we're looking at schools as ways to do that, you know, a lot of work with school gardening and all that kind of stuff. And we know that having well-fed kids leads to better education outcomes. So I think it's an exciting time to look at that. And I'll just, for, before turning it over to Zach, I'll just say, you know, one of the saddest things I've ever saw, and I, I think it was called the weight of the nation, but I just remember um, the, the host was holding up raw vegetables in front of kids and they had no idea what that vegetable was. They, you know, like they could hold up a potato. They would know what potato chips are, but they didn't know what a potato was. And that man, that was just heartbreaking. So um, I, I think there's a lot of connections and I think it's really exciting to see what's happening um, in, in connecting education and food policy. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to jump in just with an experience from the pandemic. So we had a lot of unemployed restaurant workers. And uh, so a group of us came together right in the third week of March to create something called Colorado Restaurant Response. And what we did was bring back restaurant workers and employ them to prepare meals for homebound, the most homebound families and delivered 330,000 meals between March and the end of August, uh, employing 80 restaurant workers. And the this is my first dive into the food system. And I think the food system is the only system I've seen that's more dysfunctional than the education system. I was I was I was just appalled at the at at the at the system design problems and the difficulty in delivering fresh food to people in need and the opportunities that technology is giving us to disrupt that system. Um, just like in education. So the parallels in poorly designed system impacting the most vulnerable customers or the most vulnerable people in need was, was pretty overwhelming. Um, and it, it actually gave me a little hope about the education system because I've now seen a, another system that's worse. <laughs> <laughs> and so I Maybe like, so what do you, I mean, maybe following up a little bit, Zach, like what's, I mean, one of the things that happened was um, we started delivering different districts like in Denver here, delivering food uh, and lots of districts did this outside of the school and the system because it was required because of the pandemic and delivering in all in community and different places, just like, what do you think that could mean or should mean? Yeah, I mean, actually either of you in terms of thinking about sort of the traditional notion of food in schools. Adrian, do you wanna? I'll let you go first. Let me, let me cogitate on that one. Yeah, yeah you, you cogitate and I'll go wider because okay. just if, if I could, Van, it's a great, it's a great question, but um, I think what's become vividly clear is that the school system is needed for uh, that, 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 that these systems, and, and it's apparent to people working it, these, these issues are not disconnected, that we're dealing with issues of food, we're dealing with issues of mental health, we're dealing issues of, with issues of parents needing to be at work, we're dealing with, it's become vividly clear um, that the school system has to broaden and meet so many of these needs, that these needs aren't sol solved in a vi vacuum. And so I can't tell you about the answer, but I can, I, you know, through the optimistic lens, the problem has become more clear and our suit solutions will deal with uh, the requirements of a, of a whole child, not just the narrow requirements that we held the school system to. So I'm, I'm hoping that, that we're looking at more integrated responses. And I'll give you one example, which is there's a ballot initiative coming this year. It's an out of school learning ballot initiative. It'll provide $170 million a year in vouchers tilted to low, low income kids 
to use out of school activities. So it could be uh, reading, it could be math camp, it could be summer camp, it could be uh, a, a audiologist or a specialist. So, so the gauge will be wide and the money will be connected to parents' need and it's broader access. I don't know where those out of school, I don't, the out of school learning program doesn't connect to food, but it, it's an example of broadening the lens to meet the needs of families and food is front and center and the school districts uh, are, are an essential part of that. Okay, Adrian, enough cogitation, it's all yours. Yeah, no, I, I think you uh, summed it up beautifully. I was gonna underscore what you said. And I just guess the thing I've been thinking about is, you know, given all the constraints that are put on our school districts uh, in so many ways, I wonder what the limits of this will be. Because like you said, this integrated approach is very needed. Um, I think that we put a lot of, um, of society's kind of pressures on our school system that may be unfair, but that's kind of just the reality of where it is. So I, I'm hoping that we have creative leadership that will look, um, you know, look holistically, but look really creatively at these problems and, and give our school districts and schools some flexibility to meet the immediate needs uh, of their students. Um, you know, I... I, I've been in education policy from different levels, and I know that um, you know people are well-intentioned, but I think a lot of times we hamstring uh, hamstring efforts, especially at the local level, level that could lead to really promising solutions. Yeah, the other th just just to bring up related to that, I, I think one of the other challenges is that oftentimes you know all of these things are so siloed. So we we you know we're we're now focused on reading. So there's the science of reading, focusing on that. And then it's, it's off to physical education. And then there's that. And then kids have to eat at some point. So there may be a breakfast program and something else. And there's a very, it's, it's hard to, it's easier to silo things and to do them in discrete pieces, but it's very hard to connect them in very meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and there aren't a lot of schools, you know, there are schools like, you know, I know the Green School in Denver does some really interesting integrative things around that. Um, my former school, the Odyssey School, does some projects that are sometimes built around some of these things, but it's hard to do that. Like, I don't know if you guys have any, ideas or suggestions or notions of like how particularly related to policy or other things like how we can get sort of outside of our sort of very, very narrow boxes on this stuff. Yeah, you know, one thing I would I've been thinking about is uh, it may really maybe upon, um, you know, the impetus may be on people in the community to uh, get up to speed on the, the, the standards, what, what are, what's required in schools, and then figure out creative ways to bring projects to schools that can meet the standards and do start to break down these silos and start to create more integrated, comprehensive approaches. Um, you know, like one thing I've been thinking about is, you know, how can, uh, for example, a school garden meet requirements for the sciences and, and other things, right? I think there's a lot, if we just have some creative thinking, I think there are ways to kind of square some of these circles at least. And that would that would that would fall right into the project based learning uh, uh, category, which is 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 just consistently um, superior, right? It consistently makes re creates relevancy and integration of subjects. So a school garden it can be an anchor for a writing program, a science program, and nutrition. And we we I think part of the opportunity again through the through the lens of optimism, uh, the system has been stripped down. So we're rebuilding our workforce, just, just like schools have to. Schools have been, there's been a massive exodus from teaching and that's a challenge. And it's also a wonderful opportunity as to how we rebuild. Um, so um, I, I think that the rebuilding of system design of the workforce, that there's a direct parallel between we're re we're redesigning how our restaurants operate and we need to rethink how our schools operate. The challenge is clear and, and, and riffing off Adrian, it requires an integrated solution because we can't do, we can't do it with just more. We have to do it with just better. And I think there will be, uh, oh, sorry, Zach, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm stopping my lecturing. I'm remembering uh, Vans, Van said, this is, food unmuted, but he, he said, Zach, be muted. So I'll stop <laughs> there. 
uh, I, I would just add, I think there will be additional benefits, right? Like I could see cultural competence as a benefit from like, for instance, uh, you know, a lot of cultures have a version of something like a lot of cultures have a version of a dumpling or common ingredients. And I often talk about hibiscus. There's a hibiscus is native to West Africa, but it's very popular in a lot of other cultures. And like, for instance, I don't know if Latinos know that when they go to a taqueria and have agua de Jamaica, they're drinking a riff off a West African drink that comes through the slave trade to Jamaica and then spreads around the Caribbean and Latin America. So, you know, bringing those things up and saying, oh, hey, y'all do that too. I think that could um, add, have added benefits. No, I, I think that that's so amazing and, and sort of your work making those connections that we just don't think about um, or don't have the means to quickly investigate or Google stuff. Um, so, and, and telling these wonderful stories. So the, the, another topic I just wanted to touch on, um, I, you know, during the pandemic, you know, businesses many businesses are thriving, many tech businesses, and also many, even those businesses that have really struggled to your, your earlier points are rethinking sort of what does work look like coming out of the pandemic and have retooled in one way or another. And I saw this 60 minutes segment on Sunday about um, Boston Dynamics and their, their premier robotics. And, um, and it was both um, so, exciting and frightening all at the same time. It was a segment about their robotics and their robotics designing robots that could dance way better than I can ever dance. I'm not a very good dancer, but, um, but they look like human movement. And so um, to music and um, this is accelerating after every recession. Um, things accelerate in terms of technological change and the workforce changes what should we be thinking about in terms of schools? I mean, some folks say we should be training kids to, you know, be better computer programmers um, and, and these sorts of things. I just, and other people are saying, um, there's a book that recently came out saying this is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing because mm -hmm. the machines will win. Um, we need to support folks to develop and hone their human skills that can't be replicated. Mm -hmm. So one thing uh, I, I saw that as well, and I know they were saying the machine, the robots were doing the mashed potato, but it looked like the running man to me. I don't know, <laughs> uh, but I thought it was impressive. So, you know, I've been thinking about this. So uh, there was a lot of talk about automation that that's going to be one of the tectonic shifts during the, the 2020s. Right. And even before the pandemic, people were talking about that. Um, and so one thing I've been thinking about is um, a conversation that I had with someone 20 years ago. While I was in the White House, and uh, this was, you know, during the height of the information kind of boom, and he was saying, "Yeah, you know, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on these technical skills, but people from other countries have been telling me that they've been actually more interested in humanities because that has actually led to more interesting games and more interesting applications of the technical skills." So, I don't think it's an either or, but I I, I do think that focusing so much on the technical skills really does miss out on something. And disclaimer, I'm on the board of Colorado Humanities, but I'm just saying I had this conversation 20 years ago and I thought that was really interesting. And that, and what this person from another country was saying is that has often given American companies an edge because they've had that humanities um, um, experience that rounds out the technical skills. I, I, I'm right with you, Adrian. So I'm, uh, Van, I think, I think if we look at the long game, the, uh, the role of humans is gonna be in the soul and that uh, whether we like it or not, what's happening is there, in fact, I like it, is there's an acceleration of alternative pathways after high school into the workforce. And we sure need that because the workforce needs good people and a, a four-year college isn't the answer for everyone and, um, and students need to be employed. And so that's, that's happening. And part of the implication of that is that uh, the public school system through 12 uh, need, can't let go of its, and in fact needs to deepen its, um, its, its focus on the humanities, on the development of a soul, on the development of a whole child. And that doesn't lessen the load of needing literacy and numeracy, um, which, which are critical, um, but it's a yes and. Um, and since the landscape after uh, 
high school is shifting at, in, in a really positive way to providing pathways to be gainfully employed and engaged in society, the development of that is, is, is more important than ever in our elementary, middle, and secondary schools. And if you take that to its next logical step, after the development of a soul, you have to feed those people. So the people need to be up to speed on soul food. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and, that, and that's why we have you, Adrian. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you guys should take this on the road. Um, <laughs> um, I, I was just looking to see if we had any questions. We don't have any questions from the audience. I, you know, I, the, I'm very worried that in spite of all of the changes and people adapting and families adapting to, to, you know, managing kids being at home, teachers, many teachers adapting to going back and forth, that we're in our in our desire to get back to quote unquote normal we're going to snap back to things and and um and snap back to a system that is by its design as racist and inequitable public education system how did any thoughts from you guys on how to not do that as we are coming back this summer and schools are opening I have to tell you, Van, I can think of it in other um, sectors, but when, <laughs> in schools and education, I'm just not so sure. And it goes back to what Zach said earlier, for a lot of different reasons, it just seems like uh, making change in the education system can seem a lot harder than it needs to be. Um, so that that's just my thought. Why is that? Um, well, I think one thing is you have... Um, people who aren't experts in education who are making policy. And I'm talking about people at the state legislative level. And I mean, you know, when I was a lobbyist representing the governor, you know, the ideas and the things that I heard legislators saying, um, and, you know, some of it is uh, a time warp, right? They just think um, because that was the way they were educated in the 1950s or whenever, that's how kids should be educated now. And again, well-intentioned, right? Because they believe they came out all right. They want the best for kids, but, you know, those don't always... Uh, compute and there's just so many different interests that um, seem more interested in reaching an result for their constituency than looking at the broader good. Um, so that's just my observation. I hope that doesn't sound too cynical. I'm just saying what I saw. And school boards, school board. I would put school boards in there with your state legislators. Yeah, we have we have a the system is we have an ineffective system governance that's designed to meet the needs of an industrial or agrarian society. You know, and and yes, Van, we have a precious moment as we rebuild uh, to rebuild in a way um, that elevates uh, opportunities for kids and for teachers. Um, and I hope the uh, I, you know it's I think it's the role of voters and parents um, to to demand that we rebuild better. Um, we're going to have a flood of money that comes through the various uh, American you know, rebuild programs. And um, that could create a situation where we just snap back to the old system. And uh, I think for anyone who's, who's become disenfranchised, now's the important point of inflection uh, to weigh in. Um, if I could add one more thing that's really been troubling to me, um, and this is mainly from a political lens, is I'm finding more and more parents, once, the, once their kids are out of school, they, do, they care less about public education and these other things. And um, I don't know how that got off track, but wow. I mean, you have to see that, that having a well-educated populace is benefits everybody and that we should have resources for schools. But some people are just like, eh, you know, don't confront me, none. Yeah, no, if ever, I mean, the last few years, we have too many examples to name for why that's important. Um, uh, we had one last question um, or, or a question from the audience. If there are some interesting programs either here in Colorado or in Denver or nationally that might integrate or connect, um, let's say food and education and project-based learning and, and, and training, if either of you have any sort of things that pop out to you, I know that um, there are a variety of different programs in terms of garden and internship and other things 
Yeah, Zach, I don't know. what. Do you know what the name of Alice Waters, the ones that she's connected to? Um, yeah, if you type in Alice Waters in this issue, it'll come up. I just can't remember the name of it, but I know that uh, with her leadership, there have been a number of kind of these edible classrooms or something like that um, around the country. But there's a lot of stuff happening. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of interesting things happen with um, food in, in schools and trying to get young people interested. And then even in the Mississippi Delta, which I, I just know because I spent a lot of time there, young people are disconnected to the agricultural economy. And so there's been an effort to reconnect uh, young people to farming, even in a place that's, you know, relies heavily on that. So uh, things have gotten out of whack, but I think there's a lot more interest in trying to get sync things back up again. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great question. And the second half of the question was out of school time. And I wish I could give you a program, an exemplar of project based learning or project based learning that integrates food. I don't know. Um, uh, there's a, a, a Kimball Musk's program with the kitchen and delivering a, a unit that is a, a, a is a food it is a whole science food gardening unit to low income kids it's predominantly in California and in Memphis um, is an interesting model. Um, but it's a tool it's not an integrated program um, i'm very hopeful about the out of school learning uh, ballot initiative which which provides 150 million dollars. Um, and is parent it's based on parent demand so parents get to pick uh, where their kids are focused and um, it's really open to all resources in the community so it's not limited just to people who are licensed to teach uh, there's a very light approval mechanism at the state board but i'm i'm very hopeful that providing that degree of funding will induce demand and so talented chefs will or collaborate with science teachers to create programs and so forth. So good, well, great question. Sorry, I can't give you an exemplar. Well, hopefully um, the Soul Food Scholar and Sage Hospitality will be advising some of these programs and or providing just sort of content or resources. Um, I want to thank you guys. We're sort of at the end of our time here, but I want to thank you guys for taking um, time out of your super busy schedule. Um, uh, look forward to seeing Adrian's book, which is going to be coming out in when? What's the date? What's the release date? Uh, uh, April 27th is when it drops. So Black Smoke, African Americans in the United States of Barbecue. Uh, that's the name of the next book. So excited. It's going to be great. Um, your book, Adrian, can't wait to see it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Um, you and um, thank you, Zach, and I hope that things continue to open quickly. Um, um, and I want to thank um, my colleagues, um, Edward and Mary, for helping me to organize the technological aspect of this, which I sometimes struggle with. And everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you. All right, peace. <laughs>